an underdog who makes the most of the resources he has. Especially his mind, his intellect, his smarts, his wits. Another name for Jacob is Israel. And it's not surprising that the Hebrew people will choose this name for themselves. As they were a small underdog nation surrounded by mighty and sometimes hostile nations. In this case, the eldest son is Esau, Jacob's slightly older twin brother. Jacob tricks Esau out of his birthright and inheritance with the help of their mother, Rebekah, and to the chagrin of their father, Isaac. And Esau is not too happy about that. In fact, Esau plots to kill his brother. So, Jacob flees, and adventures ensue. The first adventure was a fantastic dream of a stairway to heaven, one that we tried to make sense of last week. The next adventure is one that we're skipping over, but here's a quick summary of that story to help us understand today's story. Genesis 29 opens. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Lyrical language that introduces the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Jacob comes to a well where he encounters a group of shepherds. He strikes up a conversation with the shepherds, asking them where they're from. When he learns that they are from the same place as his uncle Laban, he asks if they know his uncle. They answer yes. And they add that Laban's daughter, Rachel, happens to be with them. When Rachel approaches with her sheep, Jacob flexes his muscles and rolls away the large stone that covers the well. And he waters Rachel's sheep. Then he kisses Rachel and starts up a conversation. Now, it might not surprise you to hear that John Calvin struggled mightily with this story. But if you think that Calvin's problem was with Jacob kissing his cousin, then you do have a surprise coming. Calvin wasn't concerned about the kissing cousin's part. Amusingly, Calvin objected to Jacob kissing Rachel because Jacob did not first introduce himself. He was impolite. This part of the story caused Calvin so much consternation that he declared it was a mistake in the telling of the narrative. Calvin was no biblical inheritance. The story concludes with Laban welcoming his nephew Jacob into his home. Jacob is there for about a month, and that's where we pick up the adventure. Our passage is Genesis 29, 15 through 30. And yes, this is the Old Testament lectionary reading for this Sunday. Genesis 29, 15 through 30. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your young, younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may sleep with her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he slept with her. 
Laban gave his maid, Zilpah, to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Milcah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob slept with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. So, how would you preach on this passage of scripture? <laughs> what would you say about it? Put yourself in my shoes and share in my struggle. I'm baffled that the lectionary assigns this text. Usually the lectionary is kinder to preachers. Usually it selects more preacher-friendly texts. Here we have a story that describes arranged marriage in which men treat women like property. And not just one arranged marriage, but two arranged marriages, like his grandfather Abraham before him and many other biblical characters, Jacob is a polygamist. And as if that's not problematic enough, these arranged marriages are between sisters. Not exactly great material for a sermon on the meaning of marriage in the 21st century. They do show us that customs and taboos of marriage have changed dramatically over the centuries. And they are still changing. We can't simply go back to the Bible to construct an understanding of marriage for today. One that is egalitarian and just. One that makes sense in our context. More theological work than that is needed. But can we find something else of value in this ancient story? I think we can. If we can set aside the customs that reflect a different culture in earlier time and place, we will be able to see a virtue that is transcultural, a virtue that transcends cultures, a virtue that has been valued throughout history and across the world. The virtue of which I speak is love. Today's story is a love story. And in more ways than one, Jacob works as a servant for Laban for about a month, apparently only for room and board. Laban recognizes that this is it, right? And asks Jacob, what shall your wages be? Jacob, who has fallen in love with Laban's younger daughter Rachel, says, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. That's quite the offer. That's quite the promise. Think about it. Would you have been a servant to your father-in-law for seven years in order to marry your spouse? Just answer that silently, especially if you're your spouse. <laughs> that would be quite the commitment, quite the sacrifice. Jacob's commitment shows the depth of his love for Rachel. Then comes a twist. The tables are turned, and the trickster gets tricked. Laban tricks Jacob. There's a wedding feast. Jacob consummates the marriage. And when he wakes up the next morning, he sees the sister of the woman he loves and thought he had married sleeping next to him. This development is quite the twist in this love story. But it, too, is about love. 
It's about Laban's love for both of his daughters. Laban is fine with Jacob marrying Rachel, but the father wants to make sure that Leah is also provided for. The story concludes. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. So Jacob slept with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. Jacob falls in love with Rachel. Then the trickster gets a taste of his own medicine when he is tricked into marrying Leah by Leah who is motivated by love, love for both of his daughters. Then Jacob agrees to serve Laban for another seven years. And finally, we read, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, which suggests that he did love Leah. It's not Jacob loved Rachel rather than Leah. It's Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. Jacob did not fall in love with Leah, but he did love her. He loved her by providing for her as her husband. For us, the context-specific details of this story are bizarre even morally problematic. But the virtue of love shines through these details, and we can see and appreciate this virtue. And God wants to see this same kind of love in our lives, the kind of love that sacrifices, the kind of love that serves, the kind of love that persists. May the Spirit make it so. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit for our next song, I'm So Glad. Um, this song... I, I always wonder about doing a song, you know, that refers to Satan. Uh, but on this one, the nice thing about Satan is we get to blame him for everything. And, uh, and then you got Jesus lifting you up. So it's all good. All right, Lord. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
first front of grace and prayer, I have some pastoral care news for you. Uh, first, a business announcement. We do have a congregational meeting right after the benediction, right after the closing blessing. Just have to stay right where you are, and we'll have a brief congregational meeting, less than five minutes long, to elect new officers. And then Bertha Forbes, uh, her memorial service has been filmed. We did a video memorial service for her with a small group of us uh, filming on Thursday. And we're putting the finishing touches touches on it in our editing room, otherwise known as my uh, son Aiden's bedroom. And as soon as that is finished, uh, you'll have that email to you. There'll be a, uh, an email with a link to the YouTube uh, channel for Bertha Forbes' memorial service. It's a sweet service. Uh, Linda, Bertha's daughter, did a wonderful job eulogizing her mother. So I encourage you to, once you get that link in the next couple of days, to take some time at some point to watch uh, that service and celebrate Bertha's life and new life. 99 years. She was our second uh, oldest member when she finished her race a few weeks ago. We uh, have some plants, Michelle Gertz tells me, tells me some starter plants, squash and some other starter plants over here. They're free for you to take if you'd like after we're done with uh, worship in our congregational meeting uh, this morning. And finally, um, when we take our offering, uh, let me explain how we're going to do that, but our offering today is different in a couple ways. One is we have not only our regular offering, but also a special offering for our deacons fund. And our Deacons Fund is a bit different from our mission efforts. Our mission efforts go uh, entirely or almost entirely to neighbors and need, people beyond uh, the church community. Um, our Deacons Fund is specifically designated for church members in need. So it's really a ministry of pastoral care. And it's used for things like um, housing, uh, food, transportation, um, any utility bills, uh, any number of material needs that uh, members might have. And it will not surprise you to know that those needs have increased in recent months due to the pandemic. And so we have been distributing from that fund, the Deacon's Fund, uh, quite generously, even more generously than usual. So we're looking to uh, uh, increase the funds there because they have been depleted. So please do give generously not only to our regular offering, but our Deacon's Fund. You can designate uh, a gift to the Deacon's Fund, uh, just put it in the memo line, the four line of your check. And the way the offering will be taken uh, is when you uh, exit today, and we're asking that you exit out that uh, entrance exit of the parking lot. There will be an usher or two there with baskets, and you can simply drop your uh, gift into the basket through your car window all right, after the congregation meeting. All right, I believe we are ready to pray. This is a responsive prayer this morning. And one of the things I've missed with our video worship is we can't be responsive uh, things, which is why we haven't had a prayer of confession, for example. We've just had a, a generic prayer at the start of worship. Anything that requires interaction uh, with the congregation doesn't work very well when it's just you looking into a camera a few feet in front of your face. But I see you today. So we have a responsive prayer, and I expect to hear you. Uh, when you hear me pray, show us your mercy. Your response is, hear our prayer. Let's try it. Show us your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of mercy, throughout history your goodness prevails. Open the hearts of all people to find you and your mercy that endures forever. Show us your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of peace. Bend that which is inflexible, the barriers that divide, the attachments that thwart reconciliation. Bring peace in this world and in our country. Restore wholeness among us. Show us your mercy. God of justice, healer and redeemer, heal those who suffer from illness, from poverty, and from exclusion. Hasten justice for those suffering under the power of evil. Give new life to all. Show us your mercy. God, our rock and fortress, protect refugees, those without homes or security. Protect abandoned children. 
Help us always to defend human dignity. Show us your mercy. God, our creator, all creation groans in expectation. Convert us from exploitation. Teach us to live in harmony with your creation. Show us your mercy. God of mercy, strengthen and protect those who are persecuted for faith in you and those of other faiths who suffer persecution. Give us the courage to profess our faith. Show us your mercy. God of life, heal painful memories. Transform all complacency, indifference, and ignorance. Pour out a spirit of reconciliation. Turn us to you and to one another. Show us your mercy. God of love, your son Jesus reveals the mystery of love among us. Strengthen that unity that you alone sustain in our diversity. Show us your mercy. And especially this morning, Lord, we pray for Karen Streeter and her family as her brother-in-law, Dana, has finished his race. We pray for Karen's comfort. We pray for Mark's comfort. We pray for Dana's uh, wife's comfort, Karen's sister. And for all those who knew Dana, bless them as they mourn. And be with all who have uh, died during this pandemic, uh, all who are mourning the many thousands of deaths. We pray for your comfort, for your strength, for your peace, for people who have uh, lost loved ones suddenly. Be with those who are working to save lives even now. Refresh them, renew their strength, and give them stamina for the weeks and months ahead. Lord, we pray for the family of Bertha Forbes, especially for Linda and Ed. We ask that as they continue to uh, remember Bertha, that you would bless them with your presence. And we give thanks for Bertha, for a wonderful life, for a long life, for a life of faith, for a life well lived. We pray for Phil Hendricks this morning, who uh, has fallen ill. We pray for his health, and we pray for his strength, and also for Maggie's strength as she seeks to care for him. And to these prayers, we add our uh, silent requests. Finally, we pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I have already introduced and explained the offering, and again, encourage you to give generously and uh, remember the words of Jesus. Freely you have received. Freely give. That brings us to our closing song, and you're free to stand if you feel so led. All right. Well, we made it to the last song, and it hadn't even got too hot yet. Uh, this is a great old tune. Have fun. Yeah. 
shine upon you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. 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 All right, we're now going to transition quickly to a congregational meeting. You may be seated. And um, there's only one item of business. I need to call the meeting order of prayer before I get to the item of business. Um, we have a quorum. Uh, Bill Baird, Elder Bill Baird, count it. How many? 74. 74 church members here this morning, plus a few others. And we're glad all of you are here. So our quorum is 50, by the way. So we can officially have this congregational meeting, and I will open us with prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we're thankful for the blessing of this day, for the breath of life, and for every day you give us. We're thankful for the worship we have just shared, and we pray that as we transition to 